chapter 5, page 1879, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. We know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore also, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We've got a glorious hope as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ were born again to a living hope, a lively hope, through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as surely as Jesus was uh, clothed in a new created body, a resurrection body, one that was never going to perish, one that was never going to be fading away, not just a body, but clothing with it. God clothed Jesus. He didn't just make him a body, but he made him clothing. And so too, we have before us that glorious hope of the resurrection. We have a dwelling prepared for us, a building ready for us. We're going to put off this earthly tent with all its creaks and tears and, and everything else that's going wrong with it. And we're going to be clothed with a dwelling made ready for us by God himself. And so it says we're of good courage. I mean, what have you got to worry about when that's laid up before you? As we've been reminded this morning, when we see all these things, and we do see so many reminders that we're living in the last days, that God is really shaking all things, and, and we, we, we need to, to wake up. We need to, 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 to put off uh, that kind of slumber and, and, and be alert and sober in these days. And be watchful as we're exhorted to be. And to be ready and dressed for the Lord's coming. Mm. As we see these things, we can look up knowing that our redemption is near. That's the redemption. That's the resurrection. That is our future hope. That's our living hope. Mm. And we're told here, in the light of that, that we walk by faith now and not by sight and I just want us to think a little bit this morning about what kind of faith we need to walk in what kind of faith is that faith which saves us well we're saved by God's grace but through faith and it's only faith remember that can please God it's not man's great efforts but it's a trusting and a walk with a living Saviour. 
And I just want to look at one or two scriptures this morning by way of reminder to help stir us up as to what kind of faith is it that pleases God. What is saving faith? We're going to look in the Gospel of Luke. So if you'd like to turn to Luke chapter 18 first. <clears throat> Luke and chapter 18. What kind of faith does the Lord say saves? And here we have an example. Luke chapter 18, page 1694. I'm reading from verse 35. It says, It came about that as he, the Lord Jesus, was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire what this might be. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he'd come to him, <coughs> he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. And immediately he regained his sight, began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. What kind of faith saves? Well, here is an example of a man who Jesus said his kind of faith saved him. It was a faith that wasn't going to give up. He saw Jesus was his only hope. And nothing was going to stop him calling upon the Lord. Didn't matter how many people told him to shut up. It didn't matter what discouragements came along. It didn't matter what anybody said to this man. He was not going to shut up. He was going to go on calling upon the Lord because he knew that Jesus was his only hope and salvation. Dear friends, that's a faith that pleases God. A faith that will never give up. We began this morning saying, uh, reading from that lovely psalm of praise of David mm -hmm. where he talks about he, how he will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be saved. Mm -hmm. He'll call upon the Lord and he'll keep on calling upon the Lord. And Romans says, He who calls upon the Lord shall be saved. Dear friends, we need to keep on calling upon the Lord. He's our hope. Amen. He's our prayer. He's our deliverer. He's our fortress. He's everything that we need in our walk through this life. And it's a faith like that which pleases God. You've got difficulties. You've got troubles. Where are you going to go? Well, the faith that pleases God brings us to the feet of the Master and stirs us to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking and calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, He's the one. He's the one to call upon. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 
and verse 21. Jesus went away from there, withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, the Canaanite woman came out from that region and began crying out, saying, Have mercy on me, O son, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. And he did not answer her a word. What did she do, dear friends? <coughs> you ever called upon the Lord and got no reply? Because that's what happened to this woman. She called upon the Lord and he answered her not a word. Not a word. His disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, send her away. She's shouting out after us. She's a real nuisance. Get rid of her. I mean, how much discouragement do you want? The Lord's not answering. And his disciples who should be encouraging you are discouraging you and telling you to shut up. What do you do? It's all I better shut up then. Better be quiet. Not this woman. She wasn't going to shut up. She was going to go on calling upon the Lord. She answered and said, I was I sent her away. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. <coughs> he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You're a dog. You're a filthy, unclean base. There's encouragement. But she said, yes, Lord, I am. That's exactly what I am. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. Dear friends, the second thing about faith which pleases God is a recognition of the filthiness of our sinful nature. Two men went up into the temple to pray one day. One was a Pharisee and he said, I'm glad I'm not as bad as other people. And then there was a tax gatherer who hardly dare lift his eyes up to heaven. He was beating his breast and saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. What was he? In his eyes, dear friends, he was the sinner. The Apostle Paul. So absolutely sure and thrilled about the wonder that Christ came into the world to save sinners, goes on to say. I am the worst of the bunch. I'm the worst. I'm the chief of sinners. Dear friends, what's your faith like this morning? You think you're not that bad? Or do you think you're the worst of sinners? This woman thought she was a dog. She knew, she knew just what she was. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, do you know what you are? In that wonderful parable about the prodigal son, it says he was longing to fill his stomach with pig's swill. That's, that's how low his desires were. He would have eaten rubbish. He would have eaten garbage. That was his filthy appetite. That's what he was. That's how far away he was. And when he saw that, he came to his senses. He came to himself. Dear friends, you realize what, how filthy your desires are in the sight of a holy God, but for the grace of Jesus Christ? Do you see what you are? You're a dog, not worthy to gather up the crumbs under the master's table. Not worthy. Not worthy. Oh, 
I hope you're walking in a faith like that. Knowing what you are without Christ. Without the cleansing of his precious blood. Luke chapter 7. Here's another woman coming to the Lord. And what was she? A sinner. Luke chapter 7 verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. That's what she was. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, kept wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet, anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who'd lifted, who'd invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who and what sort of person this woman is, who's touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them therefore will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. He said to him, you've judged correct, correct. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. She, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Dear friends, saving faith sees the depth and depravity of our sinful nature. A faith that pleases God was the woman on her face at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ knowing that her sins were many. She was filthy. And the Saviour was the only one who could cleanse her. The only one who could wash her. And she threw herself at the mercy of the master. Have you got a faith like that? Do you realise just how filthy and unclean you were when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you might have known it then, but dear friends, have you forgotten it? Turn please to Luke chapter 8. We're looking at a faith which pleases the Lord. The kind of faith we need to walk in. Go on walking in. Luke chapter 8. 
We're reading from verse 43. Here's another woman <clears throat> who's saved by faith. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who's the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the multitudes are crowding and pressing upon you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me. For I was aware that power had gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The Lord would not let this woman leave. He called her back. And what did he make her do? <clears throat> she had to confess before all what the Lord had done for her. Before the Lord would ever declare that her faith had saved her. Saving faith, dear friends, confesses before all. If you confess with your mouth the Lordship of Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that he has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Saving faith confesses Jesus before everybody. I hope you've got a faith like that. I hope you're still walking in a faith like that. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Page 1681. Jesus speaking to his disciples as he sends them out. And this is what he says. Verse 4. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? And yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men the Son of Man shall confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Everyone who will speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. Our faith needs to be verbal. We need to confess before all. That's a faith that saves. That's a faith which pleases God. And with that faith, it is impossible to please Him. 
Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> I know this is something that some might get the jitters about, really. But we're saved by faith. Yeah, but what kind of faith? Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read from verse 35, the context, we're warning about falling away. Jesus is the new and living way, and they are not to go back to the law and the, the ceremonial law. Jesus is the better way. The better sacrifice. Goes on to say, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. The Greek word there, parisia. Free speaking, it means. That's what confidence is. Free speaking. Do not throw away your confidence, your free speaking which has a great reward. He's reminding them, he's saying, look, remember what happened when you were standing up for Jesus and everything. And you accepted when they, they took all your goods away, when they kicked you out of your houses and, and took all your possessions, you received it gladly. Therefore, do not throw away your Confidence, your free speaking, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by Faith. What kind of faith? Well, it's the great chapter of faith coming, isn't it? Chapter 11. But this is the context. Don't stop your free speaking. Go on speaking. Go on in faith. He who is coming will come and not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, My soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. He's saying, look, don't give up your free speaking. Keep on in faith. Because we don't have a kind of faith that shuts up. We have a kind of faith which pleases God. Acts chapter 4. Was this the kind of faith that the early church had? Acts chapter 4, page 1769. Peter has just told them that there's salvation in no one else. Verse 12. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Only the Lord Jesus. We must believe on the Lord Jesus. Does it matter what we believe about Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you are dead in your sins. Can someone be saved not believing that Jesus is God? That he's the great I am? No. Unless you believe that I am, you're dead in your sins. 
You must believe that he is God and that he has finished that work on our behalf on Calvary's cross. Verse 13. Now, as they observed, what did they observe? The, the confidence of Peter and John and understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marvelling and began to recognise them as having been with Jesus. What did they see in these men? Confidence. Parisia. Free speaking. That's what they saw. They couldn't shut these people up. They were declaring salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him only. And they were amazed. Nobody had taught them this. This was the outworking of receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the outworking, dear friends, of being saved. They try and shut them up. So they hold a prayer meeting. We go on a little bit further. In the chapter, we find them calling upon the creator of heaven and earth. We know who he is, don't we? And this is what they're praying for. Verse 29. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. Lord, they're trying to shut us up. They're telling us they're going to do away with us if we keep on Parisia, if we keep on free speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we keep on telling them that there's no other name by which men must be saved, they're going to lock us up. So now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence, with Parisia. Lord, we need the parousia. We need to keep on. We can't shut up. Dear friends, saving faith will never shut up. I hope you're walking in faith. Don't throw away your confidence. Why not? It has a great reward. Don't stop your free speaking. If somebody's managed to shut you up, you know what to do? Do what the other church did. Get on your knees and call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I need the parisia. I need the free speaking again. They're threatening us. They've done everything to try and shut us up. Lord, take note of their threats. And grant that thy servant may speak thy word with all parisia, with all confidence. I don't want to throw this away. I don't want to lose it. God forbid that I should ever shut up about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to continue in a faith which pleases Him. Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> One more scripture. Saving faith. What is it? Luke chapter 17, page 1691. Saving faith never gives up, dear friends. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you say, oh, well, I believe that's it. No, 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 no. Saving faith, the faith that pleases God, never gives up. You say, can I, can I show you that in the scriptures? Okay. Hold your finger in Luke chapter 17. Hebrews chapter 11. The faith that pleases God. Okay? And without faith, it's impossible to please Him, isn't it? Because he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's verse 5 and 6, isn't it? Somewhere about there. And then it goes on to talk about these men of faith, starting with, um, <clears throat> we start with Abel, don't we? We go on with Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Abraham, we talk about Sarah and all these people. These are the examples, and it goes on with a whole catalogue more. And what does it say? Verse 13. All 
all these were born again and then they just kind of wavered a bit, but we know that we'll be all right in the end. Doesn't say that, does it? <clears throat> all these died in faith, dear friends. They died in faith. They didn't just start in faith, they died in faith. The faith that pleases God is one that endures to the end. All these died in faith. All of them. Name me one person in this chapter that didn't. <coughs> Jacob, while leaning on his staff, blessed the children of Israel by faith. Right to his dying breath, dear friends, he trusted and never gave up. He died in faith. And that's the faith that pleases God. Okay, back into Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> Reading from verse 12. As Jesus entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Well, they all called upon the name of the Lord, didn't they? <clears throat> when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. One. One came back to glorify God. One fell at the feet of the Lord Jesus and worshipped him, and lifted up his voice, and nothing could stop him. He was glorifying God because he was cleansed. And Jesus <coughs> answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Dear friends, <clears throat> lots of people you think that they've been cleansed, but, but where are they? Where are they? You say, well, they, they, they were forgiven, I know. I was at the baptism. I remember them giving a testimony. I remember them standing and professing the Lord Jesus Christ. But dear friends, where are they? Where are they? Jesus says, where are they? Were they, were they, were they ten cleansed? Where are they? Where are the nine? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? Is there only one who's going to worship me for the rest of his life no matter what? He said to him, Rise, go your way. Your faith has saved. Dear friends, saving faith is a life given in worship and glory. Are you walking by faith this morning? Are you living for the glory of God? Are you a worshipper? Jesus said the Father desires those who will worship in spirit and in truth. That's what the Father's looking for. Worshippers, not admirers. Worshippers. Those who will come again and again and fall at the feet of the Master. Lift up their voices and give glory to God. Dear friends, we should be forcing our way through the door week by week. Because we've been walking by faith. And in the congregation of God's people, we just want to come in and lift up our voices and give glory to the Master for what He's done for us. We should never lose the wonder of it that He's cleansed us and freed us from our sins. We should be worshippers, dear friends. 
because true faith remembers the filthiness of sin and never loses sight of it. And true faith constantly marvels at the magnitude of God's grace. I hope you're walking in faith this morning. A faith that's never going to give up. A faith that's never going to shut up. A faith that's going to bring you again and again and again in worship to the Master's fate. Because you know what you'd be without Him. And yet you know what you are in Him. Oh, what a wonderful and glorious salvation, dear friends. And without faith, it is impossible to please. It's what will please God this week, dear friends, that you have this kind of faith fixed upon the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just any man, the mediator, the one who is the great I am. Fully man and fully God, who bled and died on Calvary's cross and paid the price for your sin, and it is finished. Glory to God. Glory to God. And with that glorious hope before us, we walk not by sight, but by May God keep us in this kind of faith, dear friends, because it's a faith that glorifies God. Amen. Amen.